I just want to say that I did say last night, do not go to Chinatown and eat dumplings at 2 a.m. You'll regret it today. So um, if you did that, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, welcome uh, this morning. Uh, it was such an amazing um, day yesterday, and thank you all for your uh, deep engagement in this uh, convening. We are um, uh, lucky this morning, as uh, Susan noted yesterday, the, really the, the impetus for uh, this whole program came out of um, a couple of really important pieces of work. Uh, one, of course, was um, uh, Todd London's Outrageous Fortune, but the other uh, that we'll, we'll hear a little bit about today was uh, David Dower's Gates of Opportunity. Uh, and so we are, uh, you know, really here because of that work. And so uh, he has, uh, David has graciously offered to um, have a conversation with us this morning uh, just to kind of uh, harken back a little bit and uh, talk about uh, where we are now. So I'm going to hand, do you want a mic or do you, yeah. Uh, I don't want a mic. Yeah. Is that okay, uh, you, 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 okay for what you're doing? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll do it that way. And I'll sit here so he can see me. Uh, <clears throat> is this all right? Travis, can you hear? Yeah, okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, this, yeah, this was, um, it was something to hear you yesterday, Susan, uh, remind me of the, the work that we've all done. Uh, and it's a lot of us, and uh, it, it didn't take much to say, uh, you can have the mic for 15 minutes. <laughs> I said yes right away, even though the, the schedule is um, it's early for everybody. Uh, so we'll try to be lively. I, I, wanna, I wanna do a little bit of context and then I really need you all to, to jump in. Uh, the main thing that we wanna talk about this morning, less about, um, for me it's less about the stuff that I, that Gates of Opportunity, happy to talk about any of that. If uh, any of you uh, participate in that, uh, I, I can't remember. So we'll talk in detail, but how many of you have read Outrageous Fortune? Yeah, most of you. Good. And how many of you participated in the data collection in Outrageous Fortune? Yeah. So you remember what was happening when you were being surveyed and interviewed. Uh, so I, I want to start this morning. Uh, you know, there are any number of ways to talk about the beginning. It's interesting that we're here just a few days after Zelda passed. Um, in so many ways, there's a beginning there. Uh, in Zelda's work and Margot's work prior. Uh, but, I, but I think we've, if we start from 2002 really quickly, uh, some of you may have even been there. Uh, in 2002, TCG uh, hosted, with the support of the Mellon Foundation and with the support of the Duke Foundation, hosted a convening in Portland called New Works, New Ways. Any of you participate in that? Just a couple. Uh, so let's start there really quickly. And, and the goal of this morning is to lay out what, you're, you're actually in a continuum of work that's been going on since well before 2002, but, but really where I came into it in a focused way was in 2002. So I know I can talk about that. Some of the rest of you can bring in the earlier history. But you're in a continuum, and the really important thing for me um, to convey to you is that we are all delegates to this much larger question and Todd was on it with Outrageous Fortune. How do we change the economics for playwrights in the American theater? That question has yet to be answered and this is yet another step in the inquiry and Zelda Fitchandler, to just talk about her for one second, uh, one of the things that she said to many people including me uh, at various points she, when she um, decided to leave ARENA, she'd been there for 40 years, and she decided to leave ARENA to go take over the program at NYU, Tisch. Uh, and I asked her uh, why, how did she know that was the moment and why. I had just left the Z space uh, and wasn't certain that it was the right moment. Uh, and Zelda's answer was that she wakes up every morning with a set of questions that are burning for answers. And if the, once the institutional context that she was in was no longer the most effective place to answer urgent questions. It was time to, for her to move, shift her context to where the urgency could be supported. And so she went from producing theater to training the next generation of theater artists because that's where the urgency was for her. And in a lot of ways, the urgency hasn't changed. It hasn't changed uh, for the economics of playwrights. It hasn't changed because there is a program. It hasn't changed because you guys have grants. It hasn't changed. We're still in the urgency of those questions, and this is the context in which we are pursuing those answers. And so 
it's important for me that this morning what we talk about is what can each of us do? What is needed? What's the opportunity to move the uh, inquiry forward? When we first started this uh, particular program, which came after a lot of other work, uh, the foundation uh, really set it out, and, and Susan laid it out a little bit yesterday. There was a panel of people that the foundation was asking to help nominate theaters that could move this inquiry forward in the first round, and then it became an open application in the second round. In the first round, what the foundation was, was asking was, how do, we, how do we shift that needle? How do we shift the economics for playwrights generally? And who are the best uh, advocates, delegates to that question. And it was a pilot program. And, what, and the success, and those of you who are, are repeating now, um, congratulations to you and thank you to you, because some part of the success comes, uh, is documented by the fact that there's so many of you who are now repeating in it. That inquiry uh, is active and making progress, and you guys have moved the needle some yourselves. And now there's a whole new group and a whole new set of communities. And, and I'm so sorry that we don't have Alaska on the map, um, we'll figure that out, but there's a whole new set of communities that are at work on it. In 2002, uh, when uh, Mellon and, and Duke and TCG gathered people around new works, new ways, the question there was, how do we get out of the current model and the, and the hole it's creating around new work and the people who make new work? And what new ideas are there about how we could support the creation, development, and dissemination of new work in the theater in, in this country. And it was a contentious meeting. It was a challenging meeting. And one of the problems that we had at the outset in that meeting was that the frame was still the same frame. Even though the, the conversation was looking for some, the new works and the new ways, the conversation moved between the producer and the playwright, the producer and the playwright, and uh, to a certain extent, there were some presenters in the room. So it moved uh, between producer, presenter, playwright, as if those were the only available models. And there were a number of people, and Kristen, you, you were there, and Polly was, uh, Polly was there, sorry, Carl was there, um, and that's where Carl and I first started our work together. And we kind of realized that there were about a dozen of us in the room who that left out. We were development centers, we were places that artists in general, but playwrights in particular, were being able to sort of design their own approaches and that these were the new approaches. And it took a minute, it was a, a contentious minute for us to get into um, the conversation in the, the new ways. And in that moment, uh, the Mellon Foundation being in the room and the Duke Foundation being in the room, they started to ask questions. How many of you are there who are working in new, new ways? How would you even organize yourselves? How would we even know how to support this effort? Is it an organized effort? What is it? And what we realized was it was primarily, in that dozen, there were a handful that were New York organizations, but there were also communities nobody thought of at the time where these ideas were popping up. Um, they, they weren't on the map, and so we weren't organized. Uh, and we, we didn't have an agenda, we didn't have an idea, we didn't have a trajectory, we didn't have an inquiry. We were just trying to sustain our institutions and trying to support the artists we were working with. I was focused on the Bay Area. The Playwright Center had a dual focus, both uh, Minneapolis bringing writers to Minneapolis, but then also functioning as a, as a national service organization. New Playwrights was there, Lark was there, Here was there. Uh, and we, in that meeting was the first time we saw each other as possibly a movement or a network or something other than isolated uh, people serving the producing organizations. Uh, and if you remember the tenor at that time, and it's somewhat talked about in Outrageous Fortune, we were all, including us, not just the producers and presenters, we talked about you as my playwrights, those of you who are playwrights in the room, and we would argue over who made Sarah Rule. No, 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 Sarah Rule's my playwright. Well, no, no, we made Clean House. Well, there were these four readings before Clean House ever had a production. Yeah, yeah, but we did it. And, and the institutions argued over ownership. And if you were on the foundation side at that time, we were totally exposed as that. Every grant that came in said, I made Sarah rule. <laughs> but we didn't see it, we didn't talk, and so we didn't know our underwear was showing. And we were trying to create a movement, we were trying to make a case, each of us for our individual organizations, as the place that made Sarah rule. And I only say that because she was the one at the time that came up the most. And, and in part of the Gates of Opportunity conversation, Sarah talked about that like how awkward it was to have to say every time someone called her to say, did X theater make you? Yes. And she would say yes because she wasn't sure if she said no that she'd ever have another chance to work again. 
right? I mean, every playwright in the room knows. If you, if you dare to tell the truth in a circumstance like that, you are risking your career. That's one of the pieces of the needle we have to move. We have to be able to tell the truth, and we have to be able to ask questions and expect the truth. Uh, and so in 2002, we weren't telling the truth. And so what came uh, out of that uh, was, and I'm going to name another person who hasn't been named, I don't think yet, is Olga Garay. She was at the Duke Foundation at the time. And the part of the contentious moment, and this is like a self-serving story, um, part of the contentiousness of that moment was that I asked a question that was really not appreciated. Uh, and I got kind of slapped down by the moderator. And I was embarrassed. I'd never been in a national conversation before, so I was very embarrassed. And I left. And I was leaving the conference because I thought, well, I just you know, took a crap in the middle of the room and the whole country, <laughs> and, and now my career is over. So I guess, I'll, plus I paid to be there myself, as most of us had. Uh, we didn't have uh, the infrastructure to travel in that way. Uh, and, uh, but Olga came and got me, and she pulled me back in the room. And so uh, I have a lot of gratitude for Olga Garay because I was on my way out of not just the conference, but out of the field um, when she stopped me in the lobby. Uh, and so what proceeded, she asked me a question that then led to this uh, work. She said, well, who's the tribe? Like, if I'm a funder, who would I even support? Am I going to have to do the work of finding those organizations that are focused on artists, on playwrights, myself? You guys don't know. And so I spent the rest of the day and a half uh, trying to figure out who in the room it was. And we had a dinner. Some, you, I know you were at the dinner. You might have been at the dinner, yeah. We had a little dinner table to ourselves to talk about it. And that led me to this place of realizing that I was working in San Francisco. I was focused on San Francisco artists, a lot of them playwrights. A lot of it was um, creating new work. And I had no idea how they were going to move from San Francisco into the field. I say this because just about that same time, Peter Nochtrieb showed up at the Z space. And I said, hey, why don't, you know, here's, here's a space. You could be a resident playwright here. I didn't even know what it was. And then we had a little grant. I think it was $1,500 from something called the Turnisol Project, which is like the Sunflower Project. And I just thought that was enough for him to live on. So here, um, and, and there were four, uh, there were four that year, and he was the only one we ever saw. And he came in many days and sat on the floor. We didn't have a desk, we didn't have anything. He sat on the floor, at one point he sat on, a, on a, the back seat of a van that we had pulled out and put in there as a couch. <laughs> with his laptop, and he started writing, and, and in that, moment was where I realized, God, I don't know what to do for him from here. Like, I, I, we don't produce plays. How do I connect him? How do I connect anybody who takes me seriously? Uh, and one of the things about the, what's underneath all of this is if you, um, if you need more than yes from any of this work, if you can't keep yourself in motion on your questions, both institutions and uh, artists, then you're going to struggle. But if you can just take a yes and move forward and, and go and ask the question when you need it and take the next yes and go. That's what uh, Peter was able to do. I said, here, sure, you can have a, a couch. He said, okay, and then he started from there. And he was writing plays, and then he asked for room to read the plays. Okay, room to read the plays, that's easy. All along the way, all he needed was a yes. He knew what the questions were that were in his way. Um, and he wasn't done, and he's not done, I'm sure I would ask you, but... Uh, so the, the motion that we uh, got into there was how do we connect our institutions to something larger so that we're not in our in little individual contexts and just you know, fighting with each other over which playwright we started. Uh, and so I asked at that time, to, trying to answer uh, Olga's question, I asked, is there a way that I could go meet my colleagues around the country? Because I don't know how to create a path for the San Francisco playwrights. I had a sense that there was a uh, New Works freeway somewhere, because I could see the same six writers you know, everywhere. <laughs> I had the sense that there was a you know, superhighway, but that maybe there wasn't an on-ramp in San Francisco, and maybe it was my job to build one. So I wanted to go find out where there were on-ramps and where there weren't on-ramps and how they had done it. And so I, I had a, a small grant from the Mellon Foundation to spend six months on the road, I went to 15 cities, that's what Gates of Opportunity is based on, and just interviewed, and it, the reason it's called Gates of Opportunity was I was trying to figure out, I knew I was a gatekeeper in San Francisco, there were several of us, it wasn't just me, but there, I was one, Lisa Steinler already was one before she was even at the Z space, so I knew we, there were gates in our communities, and it was our job to keep them, and they were the gates of opportunity for other people, and how to, what kind of health 
uh, what was the state of health, what were the challenges that the gatekeepers were facing, and how did the gates open wider, what was trapped behind them, and how do we, how do we open and sustain those gates. So that's basically what you see in there. Todd was doing outrageous fortune at the same time, and he was really focused on the economics of playwrights. Both of these projects had the support of the Mellon Foundation. And it was because the Mellon Foundation was asking similar questions about how do our resources, how does our um, energy contribute to the forward progress in our field. And it, I, I want to pause here for just a moment. Susan ticked off a list yesterday of the ways in which the Mellon Foundation has been asking this question for at least the last 15 years um, about how do their resources serve the common good. And part of the common good that they're focused on is the American theater. That's part of the common good that they're focused on. But they have been very focused on the American theater, and they have been stalwart in investing in the inquiry. And this inquiry has been about economic justice for artists in the, Amer in the US. That's a big phrase. But the economy of being an artist in the theater in the US. Their resources are intellectual resources, capital, and convening power. Your resources are your creativity, your institutional context. These are your resources. They are your experience, your expertise, your years of service. These are all commons resources. And it's not for nothing that HowlRound is in the middle of this program. HowlRound is a theater commons. And all of us who are engaged in HowlRound are asking what resources do we have to contribute to the common good, and what do we need from the commons in order to continue the progress toward economic justice and artistic excellence for artists. What do we need, and what do we have? Mellon knows what they have, and they have been stalwart, and they are also very modest about it. And so they don't stand up here in front of you and tell you the amount of money they've invested, the amount of times they've convened, the, the hours and hours and hours of research that they've put into everything that they've done. And they really just tick off a list of programs like, you know, they were the parties we did. The National Theater Project. How many of anybody here been involved yet in the National Theater Project? Another, yeah, you guys have. Polly and, and uh, Carl and, and Lisa are on that panel. Uh, another huge effort, right? Not the NPRP. The NPRP focused on playwrights, that left out ensembles, that left out devised work, it left out touring work. And so another program, parallel program, the National Theater Project, focused on ensembles, focused on touring work, focused on devising. You guys are the cohort that are taking the inquiry forward that's focused on playwrights. I repeat myself and repeat myself there because I'm hoping that it will come through. This is not a gift although it is a gift in the truest sense. This is not a gift. This is, does not make you special. It does not solve your lives. This is three years for you to be part of this effort to create an economic model that works for artists, to create the circumstances, understand the circumstances that lead to community-based practice, impact in your local community, artistic excellence in the field. This is a large set of questions you've been asked to help us answer. And the important flip here is, if you think, just think about the money. I think in the press release uh, this round, and, I, and I'm not gonna ask them and I'm not even gonna look at them, but I think the press release said it was $5.8 million this time. Look at how few people are in this room. Is that investment actually enough to do what we're all trying to do, move the needle for economic justice and, and artistic excellence and a quality of life for playwrights and sustainability for institutions focused on new work. Is this room the answer? Is that it? Are we done? No. We are all delegates to something much larger, much costlier. The Mellon Foundation isn't going to do it themselves. Bless you for trying. So you're carrying it this long. Uh, and, and one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years is that partners are starting to show up. Uh, there are other types of programs that are residency-based, and some of you may be involved in them. They are not necessarily coming from the Mellon Foundation. The needle is shifting some. 
But it's this cohort, the next three years, I think, are going to be determinant as to whether we're going to be able to sustain, as a field, I don't, I'm not speaking for the foundation, I'm speaking as a member of the commons, whether we're going to be able to sustain playwright residencies as one of the answers. $5.8 million is an important investment, and it's an important injection into research. And you are the scientists. You are carrying out those studies. And you're the ones who are going to tell us, learn for us, and help us understand what we're up to and how to sustain it, and which parts are working and which parts aren't. There was, and I think, Luis, I think you uh, were one of the, um, you participated in that, maybe Will, there was playwright residency activity prior to all of this. TCG did two different residency programs. Anybody have one of those? Did you have one of those? Yeah. You oh, that's right. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, Jack, did you guys host any of those? No? Okay. So, TCG had a MetLife program and a program funded by the NEA, and they were both focused on playwright residencies. And those went away. And for many reasons, some of them having to do with the particular uh, structural issues of contracts with the NEA, nothing to do with success. But one of the things that they taught us was, well, they taught several things. One of the challenges that those programs had was there was a very light residency requirement, but it was a requirement that had to be measured in the number of days. And that number of days proved to be really problematic to do or report, particularly if you were really only giving a residency for one play which often was the case. In many of those cases, unintentionally, it led to the playwright running a program, like a playwright's lab or the education program. I don't know if either of you got in that uh, boat or will, but, but all of a sudden for your $25,000, you were being asked to run the education program of the theater and not having time to write. So there were things that got learned each round of that uh, about how much money does it take? How long does it take? Is it one year? Is it one project? Is that a residency? Uh, so three years became the next thing. And I, I'll tell you, I made a correction myself um, that didn't prove to be entirely correct. When we started the arena residencies, we actually took, we had five of them at the same time to try to see if what happens in density, maybe it's density that's gonna actually matter. Instead of everybody scattered all over the place and you can't feel each other, what if five writers were on the same staff and trying to move the needle that way? And we took out the residency requirement. And Arena at that point was, uh, had just called itself this, uh, named the building the Mead Center for American Theater, and we were trying to understand what does it mean to be a center for the American theater? Well, maybe we can create a residency in a center for the American theater that's just about your life as a playwright, and doesn't matter whether you live here or not. And so those first writers could or didn't have to spend time at Arena. They were residencies to just be a playwright in the American theater. Uh, the most successful of those is really Karen Zacharias. I mean, Karen is now one of the most produced playwrights in the country. She was resident at Arena. Arena did multiple productions. I think they're on their fourth with her now. Uh, and she's still, in many ways, a resident of that theater without the Mellon support. Uh, but others were so light that they didn't even touch. Uh, and so that didn't work either, going that way. The time, the length of time, three years was better than one. Uh, and the money was better in terms of being able to sustain somebody's focus on a residency for a period of time. And their role in the institution was maybe better, but there were still things to learn. And so that's where the NPRP then picked up and said, well, let's go back to this notion of multiple uh, sites around the country. Let's keep what we learned about the number of years. Let's keep what we learned about the salary. Let's keep what we learned about their role in the institution. And the first cohort did not, as, as Susan said yesterday, the first cohort did not ask for a prior relationship between the theater and the playwright. And one of the things we saw, the struggle, was how do you actually then embed that? If you don't have any relationship, if you like each other's work, and that's the extent of your relationship, but you haven't been through production together, you haven't been through development together, you haven't shared, a, you haven't been roommates, if you haven't done that, it's really hard in three years to make up for that. So you'll see that many of you around this room are actually working in your home communities, but even those of you who aren't working in your home communities are working in play artistic homes that you had for years prior. That became the next uh, iteration. That's the next set of things that we're asking here. Uh, there, I, I won't go on, 
um, except I want you guys to reflect back, and especially some of you who are in the second um, round. Uh, but I, I'm going to come back to this thing that I'm going to ask each of you to commit to. Uh, on behalf of the Commons, I'm going to sit here as a member of the Commons and ask each of you who are now privileged by this three years with this support to commit to making a contribution to the Commons as part of this. And the contribution we need from you is learning, curiosity, truth. It doesn't do us any good if the reports that we share with each other are full of lies. What, what help is that? That's selfishness. That's not commons-based practice. Uh, so I'm gonna sit here, I'm gonna ask you to be able to be fierce, tell the truth, help us learn, help move the needle for playwrights. How do, you, have, you have the playwright's job. Other people have the director's job, other people have the designer's job, other people have the ensembles and the actors. The institutions touch them all, but you know less than the playwrights are part of this process now. You have accepted the cash. I'm asking you to accept the responsibility and to become a member of the commons, make a contribution to the commons, and even what we learn that we wish we hadn't, we'd, learn, we'd known in advance, even what we think of as failure, if it's failing forward, you know this, we're in the arts, there's no such thing as failure as long as we're failing forward. I was quoting somebody earlier, how many of you watched Obama's speech? I loved one of my favorite lines of the whole convention. Yes, of course we made mistakes, of course we erred, that's because we tried. <laughs> we're trying together, all of us are here trying together. Nothing is done, nothing is settled, and if we don't do our job, we're the end of it. And think of all the writers behind us and all the institutions around us that need to understand how to do this. Big responsibility, um, but I think we're up to it. So uh, questions, uh, comments, I would love to hear comments about um, things that have worked or haven't worked, but then also questions from, uh, from you guys uh, of each other or of me about what I mean by saying I'm sitting here asking you for this. Any comments, thoughts? Luis, you've been in it for so long. and meet all these um, people who've been running their nonprofits for so long, one of my jobs has been to also help people transition out of their field. So this is something that I wake up in the morning uh, sometimes crying about because uh, I think that uh, I, I work with a small company in LA and I've been with them for 20 years. And one of the things I'm trying to help my artistic director of that company do is to move on. So change is the one constant in our field, right? It's the only way that we're able to make our work. It's the only way you can move on to the next production. It's the only way that you can stay fresh and you can stay alive in the business of art, right? So I think one of the challenges I'm finding is I'm going a lot to meet a lot of older people, way older than me, who I am trying to help transition. So I guess you know one of those big moments that pop pops up for me is how do we keep um, re-envisioning the field? How does the field keep changing? How do we allow ourselves to be part of that change? And when is that wonderful moment when you know it's time to sort of move on? So I think I really wrestled with that for the renewal, right? So, you know, do I still have sort of viability here? Is there, can we still make change, right? And I just want to throw that out because I think that's super important is those, those most important moments in my life as a playwright have been the moments where I don't know how to move on. So I've had great mentors like Irene Fornes, like Todd London, like Gordon Davidson even, right? Um, I think Gordon looked at Jay and I and asked us to move on in a very beautiful way. Uh, he didn't know how to say it in the right way, I think, <laughs> right? Because he had been in it for 30 years, right? But I think in some way it's like, um, I'm thinking about this a lot. How to, you know, how to not lose the, the sense of change and how to not lose the nomadic quality that I think is what makes us so extraordinary, right? Um, this, that's a great opening, Luis. Is, are there other um, questions on people's minds as you enter this, things that 
didn't occur to you, but that you would be trying to answer through this period? Um, we, the residency we're about to begin with Lauren, one of the reasons she's not here is she is two months into uh, her second child and her first child is 20 months old. And we've made a commitment over the past couple of years to become a much more family friendly arts organization for whatever that means. And we're experimenting with a lot of different things. And have any of the residencies so far had playwrights who were wrestling with being new parents, not just parents, but new parents specifically? And is there any documentation Lauren and I can look at? Because, I mean, we're immediately, we're immediately finding challenges that we're wrestling with in terms of number of days she can be in the office. What does a 40-minute com commute both directions mean to someone's life. And so anything that's already been written, we would love to be able to get our hands on. If any of you experimented with it, we'd love to talk to you about it because we're gonna do our best to document what it means for us doing it, but um, any guidance that you guys, any stumbling blocks or triumphs you've had, we'd love to hear about. Um, Great. Yeah, and let me just say, we're gonna take time for, uh, we're gonna take time for that, those, some of those questions this afternoon and get into them, so I wanna make uh, sure that you know we made space for that, so it's a great question. Uh, we probably only have another, I don't know what time it is, so we're all right. Okay, anybody have one more uh, thought you want to add into the, to the room? A, a question you want to contribute? Jack, yeah, do. You got to do this. And no, I mean, I think as we go into this that there's now 18 of us that uh, every 18 months we become a cohort, and other than that, we're 18 different organizations with residencies. And so what is... What can we do collectively to move the idea of a resident playwright and its value to an organization forward so it ripples to 18 more in three years without funding from Mellon and it just becomes an institutionalized thing? And then how do we take uh, these 18 playwrights as, uh, and, make sh and make sure that their work without their agents or each of us as artistic directors, is there something we can do collectively to see their work uh, be disseminated and produced by theaters everywhere, uh, not because it has the validation of being part of this cohort, just because we have made some effort uh, for everybody's work to be part of the American canon. Yeah, production we know matters, and, and how do we move the needle on production? Uh, the, the other thing I just want to say, and, and then I think we, I should stop, but uh, to that, Jack, and uh, somewhat to Luis's comment and, and uh, Jason, the, we're in a different era, and our f elders and our people who have been in their roles, I'm gonna look at Sam, I'm gonna look at Jack, even Ralph, for the time that you guys have been leading, and there's probably others with similar time, Michelle, uh, a lot of that era was physical infrastructure, was the infrastructure, buildings, institutions, things set in place. What's now is the virtual infrastructure. And HowlRound exists in, and ten, can knit this group together in ways that we can't do if we have only relying on physical space. We can be knitted together in communication in the virtual realm. And I would encourage you as we go through the rest of this day to think about what is, how do we use that platform? How do we use our proximity to each other through the internet? Our proximity now is values and, and our ideas. That's our, those are our, we're joined there more than we are by zip codes. Um, and so how do we use the infrastructure that's available to us, to this generation, to move the thing forward? Susan, you had a comment, and then we're done. Um, I, I just want to build on Jack's comment for a minute, because um, there are 61 other theaters that applied in this round, and I would say 60 of them were competitive. So as we're thinking about building this network, this commons, um, some way to, to gather them in um, one of those theaters had been in the first round, had been very close to the finals, didn't get it and said, and it was a large theater, um, this is so important, we're gonna fund this ourselves. Didn't happen. Applied again. Same theater, same, same playwright. And um, I'm waiting for that to happen. Um, but for the theaters that couldn't possibly afford to do that on their own at this time, how do we bring them into the conversation, make them part of the tribe? Okay, thank you all for your time this morning. Thank you for joining us on this journey, and uh, we continue. So have a great day.